Somebody sent me a new Bible. Um, and I appreciate it. I really do. Uh, I won't say who sent it. Um, some of you would know the people. It was a group of people. And some of you would know them. Um, but uh, if any of them's listening right now, I just want to tell you thank you. And I appreciate that. And it's a nice King James. And it's uh, We the People on the front. And the flag. Some of y'all seen some of their stuff. We the People. And um, I, I did. I, I really appreciate them sending that to me. Uh, I guess I guess they've been seeing me be, be very careful with that page where Revelation 9 is on it. It's all torn in half, so uh, I'll... Huh? Is that on the New Testament? Yep. And it's big print. It is nice Bible. You're not getting it. I mean, I, I don't think thou shalt not covet applies to, you know, not wanting the Word of God, but you're not getting this one, Gloria. Yeah. Boy, I had a mouth full of jokes to say just now, and I just decided because she's my mother-in-law, I better not. No, you better not. <laughs> <clears throat> Sterling might want, me, might want to hear them later, but... Revelation, what was you saying, Gary? Now you won't be able to find anything. I won't be able to what? Find anything if you do Bible. Yeah, I'll be going, I don't know where this is. We'll, we'll just hack our way through it, all right? Besides that, I have the pure Bible search software on this laptop. So if I can't find it here, I'll find it on here. Revelation chapter 9, turn there if you would, please. Um, we, we are coming out of the fifth trumpet and uh, moving into the sixth. And... Um, uh, like I say, I, I just I have been led so many times back to Revelation 9, Revelation 10 um, in my study and just things that I see elsewhere in the Bible, uh, especially when it came to understanding who who Joel's army is and to hear some of these um, new apostolic reformation uh, types. Uh, the, the, the other Bethel church in Redding, California is probably one of the most demonic churches that I know of. It is. It is full of very, very evil, uh, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils is what I'll say. And um, I actually had a lady call our church one time. And uh, wanted information about our church. And, uh, and I said, what would you like? She said, this is Bethel Church, right? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, uh, just, you know, asking a few questions. I said, well, we're sitting here. We're here in Festus, Missouri. It's about, you know, half hour south of St. Louis. And she said, oh, wait a minute. That's not the church I wanted. The church I wanted to talk to was in California. And I went, nope, that's not us, ma'am. But it's in Redding, California. They, they do things like grave sucking. They, tell, they have been told that at the grave sites of previously deceased saints, those people had uh, an anointing on them and that when they died, some of that anointing was left unused, untouched. So they actually taught them to go to their grave site and pray that they would receive that person's anointing on their life. That's called necromancy. You are seeking after the dead. Uh, believe it or not, Jewish rabbis have been doing that for a couple thousand years now. Jewish rabbis will go to the grave of a previously well-known rabbi, somebody who they thought really knew the mystical secrets of God, and they will, they will try to get that secret knowledge from that person's spirit delivered to them. Benny Hinn says, he admits that he was introduced to the Holy Spirit by Catherine Kuhlman, not the live 
Catherine Kuhlman, the dead Catherine Kuhlman. He said he went to her grave. She appeared to him and introduced him to the Holy Spirit and gave him her anointing that was left over in her life. And he is operating. And I'm going, that's, that's necromancy. You're talk, you are talking to hell is what you're doing. But that's, I mean, that's, that's where it comes from. Where was, where was I going with that? But anyway, the, this, uh, this Joel's army thing, you'll hear that taught out at Bethel Church in Redding, California. And I've talked to people who have lived out there and, and lived in that area. One guy in particular, his job led him out there. And he said, Mike, the whole town's wacky. He said, number one is California. And he said, number two, he said, that church has such an influence in this town. He said, everybody's crazy out here. And uh, I think he sought after a different place to work after not living out there too long. But anyway, uh, the whole Joel's army thing, that, that spirit is out there. And I will tell you that I, more than likely there are more people led by that spirit in this country, I'll limit it to this country, than probably are led by the truth of the Word of God and the true Spirit of God. I would say there's probably more on their side as far as human beings than there are on the side of the Word of God. So now, um, let's read verse 11 and we'll work on down. They had a king over them. Just remember that. A king. Uh, that that I showed you last week. Nico D'Angelo. Uh, this book written for children by the guy who wrote the um, Percy Jackson series for kids. And it's all about Greek and Roman gods. That whole Percy Jackson thing was all about that. Nico D'Angelo. The name Nico means king or conqueror. D'Angelo means angel, king of the angels. And that's what you have in Revelation 11. You have the king of the angels. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice. Uh, from the fourth, now, let me ask, before we get into this, let me ask you, what do you think the number six represents? While I look for my drink here. What do you think the number six represents? Man, because of what? Okay. What else? God created man on the sixth day. Yes, he did. He also created something else on the sixth day. Beast, right? And if you look in Revelation 13, it specifically says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Beast and man. Beast, because that's what a lot of, well, most evil spirits are they're beast they're a, the dragon satan is a beast the beast in revelation 13 okay but he is also a man now ponder that for a while maybe 50 60 70 years ago we would have never really contemplated this but in the age now where they are mingling Beast DNA with human DNA. Now we can actually see in real life the possibility, no, the probability that there are in secure lab sites somewhere the combination of humans with beast DNA or beast with human DNA. We already know that that's being worked on. We already know it. So we have that aspect to it. On day six, both beasts and man were created. Um, so think of it. Think of it. Let, let's go to Genesis six. What's in Genesis six? Two things. And actually, I, and I, I wasn't expecting this. 
When I started studying the number six, I was not expecting um, a secondary meaning to this number. But you're going to see it here. In Genesis 6, two things happen. Number one, the sons of God mingled with the daughters of men. Beast and man. Okay? The two things that were created on day six. Joined together. Or the gods and man joined together. But a second thing happened in Genesis 6. What was that? Okay, that's related to the first thing. Huh? The, not the flood. Not yet. But close to it. The preparation of, for the flood. God called Noah in Genesis 6 to build the ark. It actually says in, um, let's see, is it uh, 1 Peter or 2 Peter? Uh, da, 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 da. Well, the ark was a preparing. Yeah. And in 1 Peter 3, 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. So it, part of the number six means preparation. And I'll give you another example. Uh, who was born first, John the Baptist or Jesus? John the Baptist. And what was John the Baptist's job? What was his whole... Huh? That's part of it. He was a forerunner. Okay. Prepare ye the way of the Lord was what he was supposed to preach, right? So what was John... And, and how many months before Jesus was John born? Six months. He's born six months before Jesus and his whole job is one thing. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight... Uh, uh, his, his, uh, make straight his highways or something like that. And anyway, Isaiah 40 is you find the prophecy of John the Baptist and then, uh, Matthew chapter, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter two, I think, uh, prepare ye the war, Lord, make straight his, a path. I can't remember it, but anyway, his whole job is to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, Okay, and there's there's other things in here we won't we won't bog ourselves down with it, but let's look now in Revelation nine at this sixth, uh, this sixth trumpet, and if you look at the sixth seal, you're going to see something similar. But anyway, so verse thirteen, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Remember. There was an a earthly tabernacle in the days of Moses. There was a temple in the days of Solomon, beyond Solomon. There was a, a, a temple uh, after the Israelites came back from um, uh, Babylonian captivity. And that temple survived uh, to have Jesus uh, go into it and say, this is my, that my house shall be called a house of prayer. And then it was destroyed after that. But then we have the heavenly temple. Because God told Moses, he showed him the heavenly temple, and he said, see that thou build it according to what you saw. Okay, So the heavenly temple is up in heaven. We know late, from later on in Revelation that that's where the Ark of the Covenant is there, the real Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and here we have the uh, golden altar, which is before God. Uh, when you go into the, to, to the holy place, the sanctuary, uh, on the north side, which would be the right, you have the uh, table of showbread, 12 fresh baked loaves of bread. Uh, on the south side, you have the seven candlesticks, which represent the seven spirits of God. And then before you, before you go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is, you have an altar there that is the uh, altar of incense. And that represents all of the prayers that go before uh, to God. They, they go to God. Then you have the curtain. Then you have the, the Ark of the Covenant. So what, what I think we're seeing here is 
We have uh, the voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. So I would think that that is the altar of incense. Uh, and, and he says in verse 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels. We got two numbers to deal with here. Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now I've underlined that because I'm going to run something by you. Okay. And the four angels were loosed, which were what? Prepared. There it is. A secondary meaning to the number six is preparation. For They were prepared. Now let's count these. They were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year. Four things. Now that represents the spiritual realm. Again, we're not dealing, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against spirits, angelic spirits. These angels have been bound in the river Euphrates. Okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when that happened, but they are going to be loosed from that. And uh, I'm, like I say, I'm going to run something by you on the river Euphrates for a, for a little while. And their job is to slay the third part of men. Now, my goodness. You remember all the way back at the beginning of chapter 8, Revelation chapter 8, when we had the trumpets sounding um, and you had... Um, in verse 7, the first angel sounded, all the, the third part of the trees burn up, all the green grass burn up, second angel sounded, great mountain cast into the sea, third part of the sea became blood, third part of the creatures which were in the sea had life, died, and third part of the ships were destroyed, third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, wormwood, and uh, a third part of the waters became wormwood, many men died because of the waters which were made bitter, fourth angel sounded, third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon, Third part of the stars, so as third part of them was darkened, uh, and so on. You have back at the uh, opening of the seals in uh, Revelation uh, 6, the Lamb opens the seals, and um, when the first, let's see, they have the first horse coming out, which is white, and he takes, he goes conquering. The second horse comes out, which is red. And he takes peace from the earth that they should kill one another. The third uh, horse comes out, third seal, and he had a pair of balances. And then the fourth seal, uh, which is the fourth beast, the, the fourth horse, death, and hell follow with him. Power was given to him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So, man, you've got people dying already at the loosing of the, of the seals. You have more people dying in the loosing of, or the sounding of the trumpets. Now we're getting to that sixth trumpet, and whoever's left on earth, a third of them gets killed by how many angels? They've got more power than mortal men, don't they? They can kill. When they are allowed to kill. And God, God sends uh, or sounds this trumpet. And he tells the, the angel who blows the trumpet, loose those four angels. So however they're bound, they're loose. I, I have a little theory on it, but I, and I'll run that by you here in a little bit. So he looses four angels and they have been prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. God, here's what I like to believe. God created them specifically to do this one thing. And that is to kill a third of the people that's left on the earth. Now, I've had conversations with people um, in the past. I almost drank the lid. Conversations with people who, and, and I've, 
they didn't like what I said, even when I gave them scriptures. They, you know, one lady called and she said, I heard you say that God created evil. God doesn't create anything evil. I said, well, ma'am, I said, uh, I, you're right, I did say that. And I said, uh, I, apparently you have a disagreement with, with me. Can you, can you give me scriptures? And she couldn't. She just raged at me for a while. And I said, ma'am, well, let me, let me share something with you. I said, who created Lucifer? Well, God didn't create him to be evil. He created him good and he turned to evil. I said, but did God know that? If God knew it, then that's why he created him. And I read her a verse out of, right out of Isaiah, that God, where God specifically said, I create good and I create evil. He specific, I'll show you the words. I'll show you the words. Let me open up this little can of King James I got here. And uh, that's all you got to do. Not angels. We know he created angels. I create evil. There it is. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And I read that to her. Well, that made her mad worse. Okay. And then she told me, well, it doesn't mean that. But it says it. I make peace and create evil. So when Jesus chose Judas, did Jesus know what he was getting when he called him? Of course he did. God is sovereign, always sovereign, has been. Been sovereign is sovereign now and will always be sovereign. And there is no power or force that can overcome him, overpower him, change his plan for this world, nor nothing like that. Nothing can do that. Nothing can stop God. And when God creates, when Jesus picked Judas, he knew exactly who he was picking and what he picked him for. The, Paul t taught us clearly that God, that God raised up Pharaoh in the days of Moses, specifically, on purpose, made him mean, made him uh, hate Jews, to specifically show forth his power over even Pharaoh. God's more powerful than Pharaoh. And you hear these, especially these charismatic wackos, who are telling you that God cannot heal you because you won't release him by your faith. I'm sorry, but God's not going, oh, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm in a prison, and you won't let me out. That's not who God is. And so these four angels were created specifically for this one thing. They were bound in the river Euphrates. They are released upon the earth and they kill a third part of all the... When the Bible, you have to understand when the Bible says men, it means mankind, human, humans, men, women, children, all of them, all of them who are of the species of man, that's who they're going to kill. Uh, men... Old men, old women, women, women with babies, babies, children. They're going to kill all of them. Why? Sin. We're getting into the days of God's wrath now. In verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand. How many is that in English? 200 million. Okay. And I heard the number of them. Now we're get, we're not ready for the army of the horsemen yet. We're not ready for them yet. Uh, we will get there, but uh, I, I will say to you that they are not an earthly army. They're not an earthly army. Uh, we've already seen what four devils can do. 
They killed a third part of the men, okay? Now we have an army of 200 million, what I believe, angels. And we'll see that. If you keep reading the chapter, you'll find it out. But anyway, let's look at the river Euphrates. Turn to Genesis 2. Now, who has ever heard of a river that uh, separates our world from hell. Kyle, what's it called? Yeah, the, the rock band, Sticks. Got there now. I was going to say Hades. I don't know why I had that in my name. But it's the river Sticks. Now, uh, that's mythology. And I don't. I don't trust mythology. There's a lot about mythology that's just totally wrong. There are pieces of mythology, like the Greeks believed in the Titans. What were the Titans? Giants. Okay? So we have elements of, of truth in there. Um, in fact, practically every, civiliza every civilization, the Native Americans go all the way down into South America, all of those Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs, they all have giant stories. Um, there, it's all through Europe, all into Russia. Of course, all of, all of the Asian nations, they worship dragons. They worship dragons. So there, there were dragons on the earth. So anyway, you can always find little pieces of uh, a, a, a guy I heard once speak. He said, they're the fossils of, the fossils of space and time. In other words, they are the fossilized, in, in mythology, you have the fossilized remains of the truth of the scripture. You have evidence. Okay, now I don't need a giant bone dug up from a grave somewhere or sitting in the uh, uh, Smithsonian Institute in order to believe that there were giants. I believe it from scripture and I believe it. So it, to me, it's true. But anyway, you have, you have this story of a river that separates our world from the underworld or hell, uh, but the Greeks called it Hades and it was the river Styx. I also believe that there is, um, we can call it water, because I think the Bible does, a body of water that separates us from heaven. What is baptism? It's, baptism is not done in sand or gravel. Thank you, God. Uh, baptism is done in water for a reason. And generally, when they, people were baptized, where did John baptize? River Jordan. River Jordan is a very unique place. When God led the Israelites into Canaan land, he could have simply taken them from Goshen, followed the coast, uh, right on up to where Israel, the state of Israel, the nation of Israel is right now. I could have easily been a month getting there. But he didn't do that. He took them through two bodies of water. One was the Red Sea. And he goes all the way out in a circle and brings them around. Now, Goshen, and, and let me turn this way so you'll get it. Here's the state of Israel the, and the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, and here's the land of Goshen. They could have simply went, and they're there. But God takes them around. So here's the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, takes them all the way around so that they can cross the River Jordan from the east to the west, like the sun goes, like the priest did in the tabernacle. They always went from east to the west. So why did God have them cross the river Jordan? Why did, he, why did Elisha have to cross the river Jordan? Why did Elijah cross the river Jordan? Then he was translated. Elisha, his, his, Elijah's mantle fell. Elisha picked it up and, he, and he, he folded it together and he smote the waters. Or he said, you know, let the Spirit of the Lord be upon me. And the waters parted. And now Elisha goes back across the River Jordan on dry ground. And he's now the prophet of the people of Israel. And he does twice as much as Elijah ever did. He got his, got his promise. So why is God doing that? Okay. Uh, 
I think that there is a river, something that we don't quite understand, but it separates this universe from heaven. Everybody that goes into the promised land, they end up going across the river. Yes, Gary. Yeah. There's a gulf. Yeah. So I think you got something. I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're on something. I don't think you're on something, but I think you're on to something there. There's a great gulf fixed between where Abraham was, a place of comfort and blessing, and where the rich man was. Okay? A separation there. So, and I won't get into what I think rivers all represent and everything. Well, I do think rivers represent time, the flow of time. Rivers only go in one direction. Okay? Anyway, let's read Genesis 2. And I want you to notice something. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. My goodness. Did the bell ring? Uh-oh. Uh, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Four represents gospel, represents spiritual realm. The name of the first is Pison, and that uh, is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bdellium and Onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gion. The, and, and the same is that uh, is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittichel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, as far as I know, and I could be wrong on this, these first three rivers, to my knowledge, don't even exist anymore. I mean, after the flood... The, the land and everything would have changed. And you have three rivers mentioned before the flood that, to my knowledge, don't exist. The only one that still does is Euphrates. And Euphrates is a very... What, what was the Euphrates to the Israelites? Um, don't have time. Yeah, it was the land that God gave from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river, the river Euphrates. The whole promised land was bound by two rivers. Think about it. Okay? Bound by two rivers. And you had to cross one to get into the other. Anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, but kind of think about what it said. Okay? It doesn't... I, I, I don't think it's... a a salvation issue where if you don't believe me, you're lost, I'm lost. I don't think anything like that. I just like to think things and what God could be saying from the Word of God. All right? Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for keeping our minds, um, for not telling us everything all at once. It keeps our minds busy like people doing crossword puzzles or word search puzzles or uh, Lord, it's just fun to sit in your word and do a word search. It, it's joy. It brings joy to our hearts to learn things that we never saw before from your word. And I pray, dear God, that people would see it that way, that reading the Bible is not a chore. It's not a job. It's not something that they have to do. It's something, Lord, that when you put it in them, they just want to read it. So, Lord, bless us that way, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.